Hello, good morning, and welcome to Lavenders with Fran. It's Tuesday. Is it Tuesday? It's Tuesday. Uh, and this morning, I'm going to read you a short story called The Thunder Shower by Malachi Whitaker from the Persephone Books collection, The Journey Home and Other Stories, all by Malachi Whitaker, who's a very underrated, rather unknown writer. Her stories are sort of slightly strange and surreal and often rather sad, but it somehow suited my mood today. So here's how Elevens is with Fran works. You get a cup of tea, that's very important. You get a cup of tea and maybe some cake and you have a bit of a break in your own home while I read you a story from my own home. And let's hope we all find it calming and comforting and a bit of a distraction during these weird few days and weeks. Okay, so now I've witted on for a bit. Have you had time to get a cup of tea? You sure? Settle down? All right, here goes. Thunder Shower by Maliki Whitaker. Two girls stood sheltering under the sun blind of a shop where raincoats, bathing suits and rubber shoes were sold, waiting for the heavy June thunder shower to stop. Sometimes they looked in the windows of the shop at the bright and frail looking articles, noting the prices from habit, but without any particular interest. The elder girl was tall, thin and fair. She had a few made up curls showing under her hat and she was hoping that the shower wouldn't make the air damp enough to straighten them. At the same time, she was feeling sorry for her friend, who was in very great trouble. The friend, Olive, was trying to push her desperate thoughts as far into the background as possible. She was short and dark, with light, steely grey eyes, a fair complexion and thin lips. She wore clothes that were dark blue in colour, going shabby, but well brushed. Some time ago she'd sent her watch to be mended, but didn't care to call for it, as she had now, now no money to spare. Yet she kept looking anxiously at her wrist. Each time she looked, the other girl, whose name was Lillian, said, Don't worry, Olive, we can hear the town hall chimes. The two girls were waiting for a mounted policeman called Austin Fryer, who was the cause of Olive's trouble. He would be out of the stables by five o'clock, and she'd written and told him that she must see him, and that she would be waiting in front of the White Café from five o'clock to half past. The White Café was just across the road. They'd waited there for a few minutes until the heavy shower had driven them to take shelter under the awning of the rubber shop. Do you think I ought to go? Lillian asked nervously. He mightn't come if he sees two of us. Don't go, said her companion in a hard, level voice. Secretly, each girl was convinced that the man would not turn up. Yet to stand there waiting for him was at least to be doing something. Time was going so quickly. It was over two months since Olive had met him last. The drenching shower, breaking unexpectedly into the sunny afternoon, had driven most of the pedestrians from the streets. A tram, bus or motor car would pass along the gleaming road occasionally. The air was fresh. The two girls could not help smiling faintly now and then as they saw a sight which appeared funny to them. An immaculately, immaculately dressed man driving an open car, his face dark with anger, rain running off the back of his hat. Or a woman in flimsy clothes stepping unwillingly from a tram into the pelting downpour. Yet as soon as they smiled and looked at each other, their faces would alter, become strained, and the smile would vanish. They were the only two sheltering in that particular place. Inside the shop, it seemed to be very quiet, and the smell of rubber oozed out of the open doorway, permeating the air around them. Sometimes, Olive would open her lips to release fragments of sentences. If only everything could be all right again. This would be a lesson to me, forever. I'd never... She started as a cold drop fell on her cheek and stopped talking to watch the figure of a man running along Cheapside. Lillian thought this might be Austin. Olive half closed her eyes and laughed shortly. He wouldn't run to see me now, she said. If he comes at all, it'll be when the rain stops. He wouldn't care if I waited all the time in the rain. I know that man. She said it so bitterly that Lillian stared at her. Olive, she began, whatever made you... Oh, shut up, said Olive. I did and he did and that's all. And now I'm in this mess. If only I could get out of it. She clenched her fists and ground her teeth with rage. Don't talk so loud, they'll hear you in the shop, whispered Lillian, giving a scared look into the rubber-scented dimness of the doorway. Oh, oh, breathed the other girl in an ecstasy of misery. Somebody's going to hear something soon. I can't bear it much longer. 
I feel like stopping people in the street and making them listen to me while I tell them all about it. Even while she said it, she could imagine the answering voices. This is what comes of curiosity. You should have been a good girl. You've had your fun, now you must pay for it. You knew what you were doing. All lies. She had had no fun, neither had she quite known what she was doing. It seemed to her that she was only reaching out towards some satisfaction that, well, she never really got. She thought she'd been cheated. Lillian turned round uncertainly and began fingering some coats which were hanging from a hook at the side of the window. Their bright colours were attractive. In August, she'd be going to Blackpool for a week. She pictured herself walking down the promenade in one of these coats, looking attractive and carefree. Should she get a blue or a green? They were very cheap. She must try to get one before August. Come and look in the window, Olive, she said animatedly. Aren't these coats lovely? Olive walked up and stared at the goods displayed, but she didn't see them. She begun to think she had begun to think about Austin Fryer. How pleased she'd been the first time he'd leaned down from his perfectly groomed horse to talk to her. And the first day he'd arranged to meet her, she remembered that too. She was late. He had stood waiting for her for five minutes. And when she went towards him, he was staring fixedly across the road, a frown marking the space between his eyes. Even when she spoke to him, the frown didn't disappear, so that she felt compelled to say, with forced brightness, I'm sorry I'm late. That was a bad beginning. Austin was a big, heavy man, with strong marked features and a humourless expression. He was moody. He'd not much to say, and she had not much either to say to him. A kind of magnetism chained them when they were together, that grew powerless as soon as they parted. Austin took her home to see his mother, a little bent old woman with a high squeaking voice and eyes heavy with smouldering jealousy. This is Olive, mother, he said. We're courting. Are you? piped the old woman, grinning slyly. Well then, I hope you'll court forever. This was her greeting. Austin was her last remaining son. She adored him and waited on him like a slave, cleaning all his things, washing his razor after him, even once a week making him sit down on a low chair at her side while she manicured his fingernails. Yikes. She took an instant dislike to Olive, and whenever she could would push the girl into a corner, nudge, nudge her with a sharp elbow and say, What do you want with him, eh? He's 35 and still single. You won't get him. Others have tried. Ha-ha! She was always smiling and shaking her head knowingly as she sat opposite them at the tea table. When she passed Olive a cup of tea, she would say for a joke, there's many a slip twixt cup and lip, and she'd throw a smile to her son. Austin would sit heavily in his chair, looking down at his plate, torn between fondness for his mother and desire for this girl. If she said too much, he'd sometimes growl, can't you shut, shut that everlasting knitting at her? Once he got up so violently that his cup of tea was spilt over the clean cloth snatched his cap and walked out of the house, shouting, come on, over his shoulder to Olive. That's right, his mother chirped, folding her hands and watching the tea soak into the cloth. Go after him. Hurry up and catch him before he slips through your fingers. And Olive, hating to be left alone with her, went. The town hall clock chimed the quarter. The girls looked at each other as if to say, he'll never come now, or we may as well wait. Lillian spoke comfortingly. He might have been kept at the stables. No, said Olive. He always comes out on a stroke. He might be sheltering, that's all. But I think he'll have gone home. They moved restlessly. The shower had lasted already 20 minutes and showed few signs of stopping. The sky brightened, yet the drops came down heavily and unending. Lillian kept putting a furtive hand up to her curls to see if they were lying lank on her cheek. Each time she felt their dry roundness, a contented look dwelt temporarily in her eyes. She stared across at the white cafe, and as she looked, she remembered how surprised she'd been when Olive had first told her about her trouble. They'd met by appointment one evening after work and had gone to get some ice cream together. The cafe they chose was down in a basement, low ceilinged, red carpeted and close smelling. There were thick pink shades over the few lamps. Four young, fresh looking men on a raised platform played short, loud tunes, many times repeated. They felt drowsy and relaxed, yet inwardly excited by the loud music. The girls had eaten their ices and were sitting talking to each other, their elbows, their elbows on the table, when Olive said, smiling stiffly, Lil, I've been a fool. I've been such a fool. What shall I do? Lillian felt startled and sorry at the same time. In a flash, she took in her friend's meaning. It could only be one thing, or she would not have said it in the way she did. 
as if anxious to rid herself of, of some horrible dread by exposing it. But it would not do to let Olive think she had jumped to that conclusion. There are other ways of being a fool, she thought, and she gave her friend a questioning look. Olive broke in before the other girl could say anything. Yes, she nodded. Her voice sank to less than a whisper. But of course, I can't be sure. I'd better wait. At the same time, she knew that what she feared was a certainty. Have you told him? asked Lillian after a short silence. Well, I did just mention it. Olive's, Olive's voice rose a little, hopefully. But he said that that was an absolute impossibility. Yes, they always do, said Lillian. She didn't say this from experience, but as a result of workroom confidences. But it keeps on happening all the time. For a time, they listened to the band and thought. Lillian moved her toes round and round. She had some new shoes on and they were tight. She kept looking at her friend's eyes and admiring them. Didn't he say anything else? Olive gave a short laugh. Oh, you, need, you needn't expect a wedding, she said. The last thing he'll do is ask me to marry him. He said, whatever would my mother think if I had to disgrace her? He says, can't you go to one of those women? The town's full of them. As if I should know any of those women, whoever they are. And at the same time, she looked at Lillian anxiously, as if she might know somebody or, or something. There is a funny sort of woman who lives not far from us, Lillian said in a troubled voice. You might find out. In the end, Olive had nerved herself to knock at a door, feeling that a thousand eyes were spying on her from neighbouring windows. An old woman took her hand and half pulled her inside. Do you want your fortune telling, dearie, or is it something else? There was something the matter with her throat and she could only speak in a cro croaking whisker, whisper. The house was low and dark and smelt of mice and earth. Full of dread, Olive turned to go, but the woman pushed her into a chair and smiling said, Now, dearie, tell me all about it. You're not the first and you won't be the last, mercy me. No, bad thing for my trade if you was. Have you got a few shillings for an old woman? That's right, I'll have some water boiling and half a tick. No one can say I aren't clean. Take off your coat and let me put it over your head. There's nothing to shiver about, lass. We'll soon have you smiling again. The old hag had wheedled the last penny from her purse so that she had to walk home trembling and sick, convinced that nothing would come of her visit but the loss of her few shillings. In this, she'd been right. At last, she heard of a man, properly qualified but down on his luck, who could with certainty make everything all right again, but he wanted five pounds. Where do you think I could get five pounds? she'd asked Lillian. The money seemed as remote to the girls as the moon. You ought to write to Austin and tell him you want it, Lillian, Lillian had answered. Olive thought of her lover and of his behaviour since he'd heard the news. Although he said that she did not believe it, he'd reluctantly given her ten shillings to go again to the old woman in Primrose Street and was angry because they'd been wasted. You were a fool, he said, to give her the money first. Do you suppose she'd, she'd have done anything without it, she'd retorted spiritlessly. But it was true that the old woman had only wanted money and that she was more amused than anything by the girl's condition. When she found out that nothing else was to be, be had, she'd broken into a, short, a shout of laughter. "'What's it matter to you?' she croaked. "'You'll have to come down a peg, my lady, and ask the chap to wed you. "'And in twenty years you'll be playing smash because your own lass will go and do the same thing.' Suddenly she changed her tone and said in a wheedling voice, "'If you could get hold of a few more shillings, we'll try something else. "'It'll be hard for me to get and I'll have to walk my old legs off, but I'll do a lot for you, dearie.' "'I can't get another penny,' Olive said." The old woman had a few fresh flowers in a vase on the table. They looked out of place in the dirty hovel. The girl fixed her eyes on them and thought, I wish it was last year. The old woman put her lips close to the girl's ear. You want to frighten him, she whispered. You haven't any sense at all. Stubborn as a mule you are, your sort always comes off worse. So Olive had written, Dear Austin, should like to see you tomorrow night. Shall wait outside the white cafe until half past five. Your friend, Olive. P.S. It is very important. I hope you can be there. The rain had by now lessened. The road was shining. People were leaving shelter and one by one crossing its clear-cut blackness. With heavy strokes, the bells told the half hour. The two girls stood under the awning. As the clock struck, Lillian patted her friend's shoulder. We'll just stay a few minutes yet, she said consolingly. But if, if he isn't here by five and twenty-two, I shall have to go. Olive kept looking up the street. Uh, Olive kept looking up the street down which the man might come. 
Her face was growing desperate. She twisted her fingers. Oh, Lil, she whimpered. If, if only I knew where I could get five pounds, just five pounds. Her lover and the little she'd meant to her faded from her consciousness. Lillian looked around uneasily. I really have to go now, Olive, she said. All this was not her fault. She became a little impatient. Olive ought to have got round Austin, she thought, even threatened to tell his mother. Lillian felt that she would have acted quite, quite differently. Cheer up, Olive, she said with false brightness. I'll be seeing you again soon. All right, Olive answered quietly. Lillian left the other girls standing under the awning, her eyes staring at the facade of the white cafe, her hands clasped in front of her. The sun had come out again and was whitening the water in the gutters and the hollows of the road. A horse slipped on the cobbles and was shouted at by the man in the cart behind. Fresh flowers outside a florist shop filled the clean air with scent. As she walked along, Lillian felt exhilaration glowing through her whole body. There was so much to look forward to. Saturday had been wasted, but there was all Sunday to follow. That pull in seven weeks, the new coat, sunshine. Her lips parted in a smile. She turned round, shaded her eyes, and looked down the road towards the shop with the red striped awning. Nobody stood there now. It's really sad. Sorry, possibly slightly too sad for Elevenses, but I don't know, somehow it suited my mood on this slightly grey day. Um, that is from a Persephone collection called The Journey Home and Other Stories by Malachi Whitaker, who is a really unusual and interesting writer. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you for choos choosing in while you have your... Thank you for tuning in while you have your elevenses. And let's do more tomorrow. Maybe I'll try and pick a sh slightly sh uh, cheerier short story tomorrow. What do you think? All suggestions welcome. All right. Lovely to have you and see you tomorrow.